everyone, and uh, welcome, and good to see you here this morning. Let's go ahead and stand together as we join in our singing. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Oh. 
It's good to see you all here this week. It seems like so many times over this past year, we've opened with, man, what a week it has been. And this has been another one of those, hasn't it? I'm grateful that you're laughter this morning because I know it's been a challenge for so many of us. And that we're, I'm, I'm glad to see your faces this morning. And for those who are joining us online, we're, we're grateful you're worshiping with us this morning as well. Uh, this week, I was grateful to see so many things. I was grateful to see the messages that I saw across Facebook of people that were taking in others from this church and from our community for the, the helpers that we see. And we've seen all year long doing so many things in the midst of challenging times to just, uh, to, we, we now know what it means to be an essential worker and how so many are doing things that we take for granted so often. And so uh, this morning we want to give thanks to God. We've sung about God's faithfulness and how great our God is. And those are good reminders on weeks like these. Well, this morning, uh, we're glad you're here, and, and you'll see in the, in the chair in front of you in that row somewhere, there's a, some cards that we'd love for you to fill out. If you're one of our guests or if you're one of our members, let us know that you're here. You can fill that out and put that in one of the offering boxes that are outside of our doors this morning. Uh, if you're online with us, we're so glad that you're here. Maybe this is your first time joining us online, and if so, we'd love for you to text the word NEW, N-E-W, to 972-597-1090. That'll be a great way for us to get connected with you. And we're grateful for all of us who are connected this morning, worshiping together. We'll share in a time of communion a little bit later on in our service. If you didn't get a, a communion cup on your way in on one of the tables, then we encourage you to do that before our communion time a little bit later on. We'll, we're also going to sing songs uh, to God together. And this is our final week in the Old Testament as in our journey through the story. And so if some of you are longing for Jesus, Jesus is coming. We're going to celebrate Christmas in February this year. Uh, but we're, we're grateful uh, for that opportunity uh, to finish up and wrap up the Old Testament and see what uh, comes as we turn over to the New Testament and God's story there. Again, we're grateful, no matter who you are, where you find yourself this morning, that you are here with us, that we get to worship God together. One more reminder before we close uh, just this announcement time in first service, and that is that today is our Discover Green Velokes class. And so if you're new to our church family and you're here or you're online and you can make it after first service, uh, we encourage you to find your way down to room 171 at the end of this hallway, and uh, we'll be glad Greg Kaufman and I will be there uh, to, to greet you there and to tell you more about our church family. And uh, again, we're so grateful for this opportunity this morning to be able to worship God uh, together. So right now, uh, I want to ask you to stand again. Let us continue in our worship uh, of God.
There's a strange passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about this whole thing we're about to do now. Now, you've heard this passage read and referenced probably a lot over the years if you've been in church for any amount of time. But there's this problem going on in Corinth about this meal that they're gathering to partake in together. Some are eating before others show up. Some are getting drunk at this meal. It's not as it should have been. And then there's this line here in verses 27 and following that I just want to read to us and reflect on as we partake in this bread and this cup this morning around the Lord's table. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now we tend to focus more on the joy-filled parts of the table, right? The communal parts of this, the fact that Jesus has died, but he's been resurrected. Growing up, I remember talks about the nail is going into his hands. I remember this feeling of all that was the cost of this and this idea that you can do this in an unworthy manner. What does this mean? I don't want to do this in an unworthy way. We ought to examine ourselves before we come to the table of the Lord. This is an opportunity for us to, to sit with Jesus, to be reminded of why we come together and of the life we've committed to live together. But there's this line that I find interesting in chapter 11. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Well, one way to take that is that we need to focus on the body of Jesus on the cross, right? All that he endured and all that he suffered and, and then he was raised to new life and the fact that this body that we partake in, this bread, this cup, we're so grateful for what's been given for us. And so yes, we ought to, we ought to do that. We ought to discern the body of Christ. But I also wonder if that idea of the body of Christ isn't just the body of Christ on the cross. But it's the body of Christ that sits around us as well. I haven't been here for a decade or more. Keith Maloney knows many more stories than I do of so many of your lives. But as I look out this morning, I do know some of your stories. And I do know that the body of Christ that gathers here does remarkable things. There's things I know about and there's things I don't know about. And, and so this morning, I want to reflect on the body of Jesus. Literally, the, the body of Jesus that was killed for us, that was raised from the dead. But I also wouldn't want us to do this without examining and reminding ourselves of the body of Christ around us. And that's not just those who are in this room. That's so many of you who are online that have been now for almost a year as we come up on March. So this morning, I want to encourage you to those two things. I don't know exactly what it means to eat and drink judgment on ourselves, and I don't want any part of it. But I do think it's important for us to discern the body of Christ in two respects. Again, the story that we come to celebrate this morning at the table, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but also the body of Christ that spread around us and around the world, really. And so spend your time this morning as we're partaking this in just a moment, discerning those two things, if you would. Let's pray this morning. God, we are grateful for this meal. And God, there's some sense of seriousness about this meal that we understand the Corinthians didn't quite get and, and sometimes I think we probably pass this over without enough thought either. So God, th this morning we want to examine ourselves but we don't want to be self-focused. We also want to remember that our identity is secured not in our own righteousness but in what you have done on the cross in your son Jesus. And God, this morning I'm also grateful for the saints who are gathered here and gathered online many of us feel more like sinners than saints, but you remind us over and over again in your scriptures that we are the called ones of Jesus, that we are the holy ones, that we have been set apart, that you want us to be salt and light. So God, I thank you for those who will be partaking with me in just a moment here and, and doing that all over the place, God, today. We pray this in the name of Jesus.
dismiss our kids for their children's worship. So children's worship is for children three years old up through sixth grade. So uh, our children's ministry volunteers are over here at this door to my left, and they're ready to greet you. So uh, children, you can be dismissed at this time, and I want to, usually one parent they want to have go with them, and uh, they'll meet you right over there by that door and head down to the children's worship area. Now let's go ahead and stand one more time before the lesson as we sing. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. several weeks in some places of scripture that I don't spend enough time in. My gospels are well worn and the letters of Paul and even the stories in Genesis and Exodus and other places. I I know those stories well. These I've had to be reminded of and there have been important things that I've forgotten. 
uh, that has been good to return to. I'm grateful for the ways that you're engaging in the story, and uh, many of you have been reading along, and, and some of you have been doing your best to kind of stay along as life's been crazy. I want to encourage you, though, as we start uh, next week again, if maybe you've gotten out of the habit of reading your chapter ahead of uh, Sunday, we're starting a kind of a new fresh start with the New Testament. And so uh, if, you, if you get a chance, read chapter 22 this next week, uh, The Birth of the King. And uh, again, we'll be focused on the story of Jesus' birth and then into his life and then uh, leading up to resurrection on Easter Sunday that we'll be focused on and then through the rest of the New Testament. Uh, but I want to encourage you to do that. If you don't have a copy of the story, uh, find me after the service or you can talk to Rex Taylor out in the back. Uh, we'd love to make sure you uh, get, a, get a copy of the story before you leave today so that you can be caught up next week as we come uh, back together to worship. Well, we're two-thirds of the way through today. And uh, I think part of the design of the story is really that we would be hungering for Jesus when it comes time. And, I, and that's where I'm at today. I'm ready for some good news. Um, and we get a little bit of a hint of that today as we open this story uh, this morning at the end of of the Old Testament. Let's pray as we open uh, God's Word together this morning. Father, I, I'm grateful for your Word because it's in your Word that we find instruction for the kind of life that you desire for us to live, the story of, of redemption, the story of reconciliation and forgiveness. God, that you've given us the task of being your ambassadors, your reconcilers in the world. God, I'm grateful that this story that we read, it doesn't end with the final page uh, of Scripture, that we are a part of the ongoing story of what you're doing and what you're writing in this world, God. And you've put us in touch with plenty of people around us who could sure use a, a word of good news in the midst of our, 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 our challenging times. So God, I pray you would, uh, would equip us this morning with that word, that you would transform our lives, that we would have a testimony to give of your faithfulness and of how you've shaped our lives because God when we have a testimony to give we can't help but share that good news with others and I pray this morning you would pour through me the gift of preaching so that Christ would be formed in our hearts and it's in the name of Jesus that we all pray and all God's people said Amen well, last week we were in the book of Esther a great story about a queen who saved uh, her people but two weeks ago, if you think back, we were actually talking about the story of the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Again, the people of God have been spread out across uh, many different empires at that time, the Babylonians and the Persians and, and the Assyrians, and we've read those stories, and, and it was a struggle when they returned to Jerusalem for the first time. King Cyrus of Persia had given them permission to do this, and Zerubbabel goes back with 50,000 people who are called and stirred by God in their spirits to rebuild the temple but along the way they get discouraged and distracted for 16 years the the temple sat unfinished as they went about their business building their own houses but finally at the end of the story with some encouragement from the prophets in those times they were able to finish the temple and today's story picks up after the completion of the temple in jerusalem this comes in the book of ezra this morning so if you want to turn in your bibles or on your phones or tablets there ezra chapter 7 where I want to read from this morning. Bear with me as I read some names this morning that are not easy to start the morning with, but we'll get through it. After these things, that is the completion of the temple, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Marioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abdeshua, the son of Phinehas, now hopefully we're getting to more familiar names, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king granted him everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of, of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the fifth month. The first day of the first month, I'm sorry. 
and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. For the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to its uh, to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. I know there are a lot of names there, and many of them we don't know. But Phinehas and Eleazar and Aaron, yes, Ezra comes from a significant family in the story of God's people. If you remember back, right, you've got Moses, who's the one who leads them through the Red Sea in the Exodus story. Aaron is his brother, and Aaron is uh, the first priest who shows up, and, and after that comes Eleazar and then Phinehas. That's who Ezra's family is. He's a priest that comes from this great line uh, of priests. And I, I find this story uh, fascinating, really, as little as I remember it from my VBS stories. Because it's remarkable what happens. King Artaxerxes of, of Persia is a pagan king who is over the greatest empire of his day. And when he sends a delegation back to Jerusalem, he doesn't send a political leader. He doesn't send a military leader. Of all things, he sends a priest after the temple has been completed. A Jewish priest, of all things, to serve the, the people by helping them to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. And I think this is a powerful lesson, if you think about it, about the kind of influence we can have in our own day. Because here is Israel, here are the Hebrews spread out across in all these lands of exile. And they've had the kind of influence that here is a pagan king who's sending them back to Jerusalem and he sends priests to instruct them in the word of the Lord. Just think back over the last several weeks, we've had Daniel who served and Esther who served with influence over several kings of Babylon and Persia. Daniel served under four kings during his lifetime. Nebuchadnezzar, you remember when he interprets his dream, and, and then there's the story of, of the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the first king that Daniel serves under with his friends. And then there's uh, Belshazzar, the story of the handwriting on the wall at the party. Do you remember that scene we read about? And then there's Darius. Darius is the one that is the lion's den story that we know so well from the book of Daniel. And then finally, King Cyrus, who began this process of sending them back uh, to Jerusalem. And during those years, these kings, they saw the faith of these faithful people in Israel, or, or in, in exile, but the people of Israel. They saw the power of God. In fact, they proclaimed many of them, this God is God. The God of Israel is more powerful than the gods we've served. It's remarkable in these stories. And then there's the story of Esther we talked about just recently. Esther was married to King Xerxes, well, it never really seems, or we never read about Xerxes putting his faith in God, we do find along the way that he saw the faithfulness of the Jewish people under the threat of persecution because of Haman's despicable plot to kill all of the Jews. And here we are, the king in Ezra 7 is Artaxerxes, the son of Xerxes. And so Xerxes was married to Queen Esther. And in that story, we find out that his son, is the one now who's king, who's now sending Ezra back to Jerusalem in order to instruct the people in the law of God. And so Esther's impact on Xerxes must have had an impact on Artaxerxes. He saw what had happened and how God had been faithful. And in an ironic turn of events, of events, Artaxerxes, the pagan king, wants the people who are returning to Jerusalem to be instructed in the law of their God. And in order to do that, he sends Ezra this great priest from a line of priests. Now, who is Ezra? Well, we read about it. I just shared that with you. He comes from this great line of priests, but it wasn't just a heritage of faith. It wasn't just a lineage of faith. It's important for us to see the same thing in our day, that we don't just come from this heritage of faith and then faith just gets downloaded onto us. No, Ezra had to study the word of God himself. He studies, he, he meditates on this word so much so that he's ready to instruct the people. And I think that's an important word for us because some of us, we, we learn growing up over and over again all these stories of faith but it's vital for us to continue to lean on into those stories to continue the journey of faith ourselves to be faithful to what we read there but i love the description of ezra in ezra 7 verse 6 let me read this again he was a teacher well versed in the law of moses which the lord the god of israel had given the king had granted him everything he asked for the hand of the lord his God was on him. King Artaxerxes picked the right man for the job. 
And King Artaxerxes actually does better than many of the kings of Israel did in the past. King Cyrus sent Zerubbabel and 50,000 others to build the temple in Jerusalem. And King Artaxerxes is going to send Nehemiah to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And you read that story this week if you picked up the story. And that tends to be the center of our focus is on the wall being rebuilt around Jerusalem. But hear me on this. The temple and the wall won't mean a thing unless the word of God is placed at the center of the lives of these returning exiles. Think about how true this is today in our lives. I've seen this over and over again. We make plans, don't we? We build a house. We plan a wedding. We get our kids in the right uh, sports teams and the right schools and we get them in the right youth group and we set up everything we possibly can to get placed in the right place. But at the end of the day, if the word of God is not the, at the center of our lives, none of that other arranging of things is really going to make all that big a difference. And that's why God gave them the law after he delivers them out of the Exodus story, out of Egypt. He gives them the law before they enter the promised land because they need to know how to live because they've seen the nations around them. They don't know what it looks like to live as the people of God. A rebuilt wall and temple are meaningless without a recommitment to the law, the, the, the teachings of God. But don't miss the irony here. This is a pagan king who sends Ezra to lead them back to the word of God. I love how this works. God has allowed his people to end up in captivity to a pagan nation because they didn't follow God's word. And now the pagan nation's king is the one who's sending them back saying, would you please follow the instructions of Ezra? God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? It's going to be the pagan nations that are going to remind them who they're to be as God's set-apart people. There's a phrase at the end of verse 9 that I like as well about Ezra. This is what it says. For the gracious hand of his God was on him. The Lord's hand was on him is the phrase there. Used to describe in some way the, the special presence of God on Ezra. And it came up several times in our reading this week, if you read along in the chapter. Now, why was the Lord's gracious hand on Ezra? I want to know that because I want that to be true in my own life. I want that to be true in the lives of my children, in the lives of our church family. That God's hand was upon them, gracious hand. Well, verse 10 actually shares with us why I believe God's hand was on Ezra. And I think it's teaching from this verse that can help us in our lives this day, day as well. Let me read again the, the second, last part of verse 9 and following about the reason that God's hand was upon him. For the gracious hand of his God was on him, verse 9, verse 10, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. Now, what are the three reasons that are given for God's gracious hand being upon Ezra? First, he was devoted to studying the law of the Lord. Second, he observed the law of the Lord. And third, he taught the law of the Lord in Israel. First, he studies the law. It's hard to teach the law if you don't know the law, right? And, and Ezra starts in that place from this long line of people who've had the law of the Lord passed on to them. Ezra gets God's word written on his heart in his DNA. And my hunch is that it shapes his heart so that his desires become God's desires. And this is one of the reasons we've been on this journey through the story. It's because it's important that we know the word of God. It's important that we know the story that we've committed our lives to, that we download that into who we are, that we study the law, the word of God. But second... And this is an important point because it can be easy to read through the story and miss this part, which is the point of the story. Ezra obeyed the law of the Lord. He didn't just stop at studying it. Once he studied it, he did it. And the order of this verse is actually extremely important for us to pay attention to. He studies it, he does it, and then he teaches it. Some people like to study it, and we never really get around to doing it. And then others, like myself, are inclined to study it and then begin to teach it without the middle step of putting it into practice. But every time we spend time reading Scripture, there are two questions we ought to ask ourselves. What is God doing in this story, in this text? And then what are we called to do about it? How are we called to put it into practice? 
Because when we do the word of the Lord, it brings deeper understanding. In one sense, you don't really understand the word of God just by memorizing a set of facts or knowing the story well. You know the word of God when it begins to be a part of your regular life. Psalm 119, verse 100. David says this about this very idea. Psalm 119, verse 100. I have more understanding than the elders. Why? For I obey your precepts. Understanding comes from obedience. Almost 100 years ago, Oswald Chambers wrote these words. All God's revelations are sealed until they are opened to us by obedience. You will never get them open by philosophy or thinking. Immediately you obey and a flash of light comes. Let God's truth work in you by soaking in it, not by worrying into it. The only way you can get to know it is to try, uh, stop trying to find out. Obey God in the thing he shows you, and instantly the next thing is opened up. One reads volumes on the work of the Holy Spirit when five minutes of drastic obedience would make things as clear as a sunbeam. I suppose I shall understand these things someday. You can understand them now. It is not study that does it, but obedience. The tiniest fragment of obedience in heaven opens and the profoundest truths of God are yours straight away. I think it's a wise word. James 1.22 says the same thing. It says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So I'm thrilled that we're studying the story, but I hope through these last uh, couple of weeks, or months now, many months, that you've been trying to seek to put these words into practice. So he studies the law of the Lord, Ezra does, and then he obeys the law of the Lord, he observes it, and then finally he teaches the law of the Lord. And when Ezra studied and practiced the law of the Lord, he had a testimony to give. That's what happens. You read the word, you put it into practice, and all of a sudden you have a story to tell. That's the powerful gift that each of us have when we put God's word into practice, is we begin to experience who God is. We begin to experience that faithfulness actually works out, that God is present and active. And, and all of a sudden we have a story and a testimony to share with those around us. It makes sense that teaching would be the final step in this process, right? You can't teach unless you understand, and you, you understand, and you study the law of God. But you can study the law of God, and if you haven't put it into practice, your teaching will never be as powerful as when you have a story to say, to say, yeah, you know, when I put this into practice, this command of God, here's what happened as a result of it. Our journey through the story gives us, every one of us, an opportunity to share, to teach others about the Word of God, not just to instruct them and to take them to task about how they haven't followed what they should have, but to begin to tell from our lives the story that comes when we put it into practice and to say, this is what the abundant life looks like. This is what Jesus leads us to. And I hope we're receiving those opportunities through the story, that you're reading the chapter, that you're engaging in this in small groups, and you're realizing this would be an opportunity for my friend who needs to come to know Jesus. It's the good news of the Lord that God's given me to proclaim to these people who are around me. God's put you in touch with people that you have a chance to speak the good news of God to. And it happens when we study it, and when we obey it, and when we put it into practice and teach it. Now we're coming to the end of the Old Testament this morning. As we close our study of the Old Testament, things are better than where they started. God's people are back in Jerusalem. The temple is rebuilt. The wall surrounding Jerusalem has been rebuilt thanks to Nehemiah. In, in just over 50 days, the wall's rebuilt. And the people of God are being taught the law of God through priests like Ezra. But our Old Testament ends with a hint that the story is not complete at this point, that it needs a, a, a happy ending. It needs more to this story. Like the end of your favorite uh, TV show, it, the season ends with a bit of a cliffhanger most often, doesn't it? And as we read this week, Malachi 4 provides us that cliffhanger. I want to read from, from the end of the Old Testament here in Malachi as we lean forward into next week, as we lean forward into the fulfillment of these promises that Malachi gives. Malachi 4.4 4 says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and the laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. So before you move forward into what's next, you have to remember what has been given, the story of God. Study the law of the Lord. That's what Ezra told us, and that's where Malachi begins his final instructions. And then comes the teaser. 
the to be continued, verses 5 and 6. See, I will send a prophet, Elijah, to you before that great and dreadful day the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. I like that word that opens verse 5. See. This is always the challenge for the people of God, is that God's always at work. The question is, will we see? Will we have our eyes open? Will we be alert for what's on its way? Keep watching. Keep your eyes open. Something is coming. God is still planning to send the prophet Elijah for whatever that will mean, and we'll read about that in the coming weeks. He's going to turn the hearts of his people, or else he may come with destruction. It's an ominous ending a little bit, isn't it? The end of this. But there's also this hope that there's more to come. And I hope that'll be maybe a to be continued for you as you enter back into the story this coming week. Because as much as we celebrate the birth story of Jesus in Christmas, it's important that we understand what Christmas fulfills. And that's what these great prophets have allowed us a picture into. That's what's given us hope for what comes next. And maybe this is the week that you want to invite a neighbor or friend back next week with you or to join you online to be able to worship and to learn more about this Jesus who is the answer to the hope that we have. So I look forward to sharing more next week. But I want to just close with this idea again from Ezra. God's hand was, gracious hand was upon Ezra. Why? For he was someone who studied the law of the Lord. He observed, he obeyed the law of the Lord, and he taught the law of the Lord. May we be those kinds of people this week. Let's pray as we close this morning. God, thank you. Thank you for the law that you have given to us. Thank you for the story that we have been engaged in again, for the reminders it has given us, for the hope that it has given us. God, for the opportunities it, it, it continues to give us to be your people and to share your good news. God, I pray this morning, wherever we find ourselves, that we would find ourselves in you. We find our hope in you, and as we see this ellipsis, this to be continued, at the end of this message, God, may it be a reminder to us that just as those early ones waited on a Messiah, we wait for him to come a second time still. Give us hope this week, God. Continue to help us to be, to be the kind of helpers that others need in our city and around our county this week. And allow us to be the people who hear the word of the Lord and study it, who observe the word of the Lord. And God, give us a word to speak those who need good news all around us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Be standing now as we close our time this morning. Well, one part of the book is complete. But there's a whole other third that I'm excited to share with you beginning next week. And maybe this will be your first time through it, or, or maybe it's your hundredth time through it. But may you, my brothers and sisters, generously share the abundant life that Jesus has offered to you. Go in peace today.